Bonjour. That's the only French word I'm going to use today. That's it. Uh, it's great to be here at La Hoc, and I'm hopefully going to present some ideas that will take you away from your comfort zone and put you someplace else, someplace maybe a little bit scary. And that's certainly what I have gone through in the last two years of working on this book. Uh, who am I? I'm really kind of nobody, but 35 years ago I testified before U.S. Congress about cyber war, and they said, Mr. Schwartow, why would the bad guys ever want to use the internet? And that was what they believed you know, back in those days, and that was Congress. So now today, I'm going to get this. And so today we have new technologies coming, and everybody's using AI and talking about the metaverse for whatever that uh, may be worth. I've written a bunch of books on cyber war, so I have an idea, hopefully, about what I'm talking about. If you don't know who I am, you can go to ChatGPT. They think that I am the Starship Enterprise captain, so we can work with that. What is the metaverse? Well, a lot of different ideas, a lot of different technologies that are being glued together, and I think most of what I hear from big tech, I think most of it today is pretty much bullshit. Because what we are doing today with the metaverse and where we want to take this technology, we are building, we are terraforming the planet for Internet 3, whatever term you're comfortable with. We are building new infrastructures that will capture our minds, just as the Internet 2.x today. We live it, we breathe it, and we're going to do the same thing again with metaverse technologies. Only this time, if we get it wrong, something very, very bad is going to happen. So, metaverse. Is it shopping? Yeah. Uh, is it entertainment? Sure. Is it gaming? Maybe today the metaverse is more like gaming than anything else because there is immersion. It's all about do you believe the experience that you're having? So there are some great cases that are being used in business uh, using digital twins for factories, for manufacturing, uh, doctors. Doctors can operate on a thousand virtual hearts before they cut you open. And that is probably much better training than they're getting today. Are these the metaverse? Well, according to Neil Stevenson, no. But I look at the metaverse as an evolving, it's constantly changing. And this is what Saudi Arabia is building. This will be a one kilometer cube, and when you go in, you will be living in the metaverse according to the designers in Saudi Arabia. Is it real? Is it going to work? We don't know. But they're going to spend 800 billion euros to make that work, or not work, as the case may be. So, I call the metaverse the most powerful, addictive, reality-distorting technology ever created, ever thought of. And it can also predict the future if you know how to manipulate all of the pieces that go into it. It will allow people to choose their own realities, choose their own fantasies, and immerse themselves in an alternate reality that they like. Nothing to do with anybody else's choices unless you get up into what I call class two, class three meta war, similar to cyber war, where corporations start getting involved, where surveillance capitalism is even worse. 
and where political extremists and radicals can use this technology to indoctrinate people even faster. The metaverse began 12,000, 14,000 years ago, but I'm gonna begin with the 1870s. First time in history, technology made by man was in the middle of two human beings communicating. First time, technology moved slowly. Then along comes radio. And what was the goal of radio back in the 1920s? It was to capture your imagination and get you to, and your family, to sit around a speaker and stare at it and then visualize inside your mind the story. It's all about the storytelling, just like books, just like art, just like the movies. It's all about storytelling. And when you are telling stories to immerse people into the experience, the goal is for them to believe it. April, sorry, October 30th, 1938, Orson Welles was giving a radio show and it was a fake news radio show where he said, the aliens are landing. And thousands and thousands of Americans ran outside with their guns trying to shoot down the aliens that were all in their head. None of it was real. Technology gets better and better. We go from black and white, we go to color, we go to 3D and now we're in XR, VR, AR. All of them are more immersive, more believable experiences than we've had over the years. And at the end of the day, if this technology goes the way Neil Stevenson says, we end up with a holodeck where the meta point, the meta point is reached where this reality is indistinguishable, cannot tell it apart from the artificial reality inside the metaverse. That is the meta point, some people call it the singularity. It is the goal, the ultimate goal of storytelling is to create this. And this comes down to what is truth, what is belief, and it comes down to faith. Do you absolutely, totally, without any question, believe something, or are you kind of maybe? Yeah, it sounds good, but I'm not sure. We all know some people, and in the US we have too many, of extremists who are absolutely 100% convinced of their religious or political beliefs, nothing will change their minds, no facts. Nothing will change their minds. And that is part of the goal here with the metaverse is to alter your subjective sense of reality and convince yourself that the objective one that we all share is the same. How many realities are there? We don't know. Are we living in a simulation? Maybe. Are we part of a God-like universal creation? Maybe. But what we are building is that simulated reality in the upper right. And that will be a different reality. So then we ask, the creatures that we build and develop and code to put into that reality, do they know we exist? Or are they just bits floating around? And the same question with perhaps a lower reality beneath ours, more of an absolute reality. Do we know that there are other creatures, other intelligences? No, not for sure. Maybe when the UFOs land next week, we will learn more. But today, we just do not know. Our sense of reality is created by two things. One, our senses. 
Very simple. All of our senses pick up what is going on in the agreed upon reality that we share. The second part is our memories, our beliefs, the deep-seated portions of what we call the lizard brain, the animal brain, where things operate automatically. Very interesting numbers here. If you look under processing, unconscious processing power is four times 10 to the 11th bits per second. That's what's going on in your brain that you do not know. You are only aware of two kilobits per second. And of those, you can only consciously process nine bits a second. We know this from neuroscience. So the question now is, who is in charge of your brain? These are the numbers. We don't know for sure. We have fundamentally five major senses. Vision, hearing, touch, smell, and taste. Those are what put together our sense of what we think is real. This is part of the goal of the Meta Warriors to rebuild our reality for whatever purpose it may be. So we begin with the eyes, and the eyes are amazing, an incredible technology. Now what I want you to do is just look in front of you, look anywhere in the room, and as you're looking at it, you feel and see this big environment. This everything is big and it's beautiful. Your retina, your eyes, are only sending to your brain 1% of what you think you see. The rest of it is your memory, gluing together your old memory with what you see out of what is called foveated rendering. That's all you see, 1% is all we can focus on. We have no vision over here at all. So what's real? Our memory plus our senses is what we then now call reality. It's an amazing technology, and 80% of our sense of reality comes from the eyes. About 10% comes from the ears. With ambisonics, with spatial audio, we can make the sound sound like it's coming from absolutely anywhere. So if I'm watching something and there's a big explosion behind me, what's going to happen? My automatic unconscious brain is going to make me turn around and listen and pay attention. The interesting thing here, and it's all about time, is how long does it take perception to work? Well, the eye, when you look at, an, uh, look at a, something on a screen and then you press the button, it's about 300 milliseconds. That is the full processing time from input to output of the human sensory system. With audio, it's 150 milliseconds, and there are other things that can operate faster, but it's all about a delay, because there is no such thing as now. There is no now. We do not know what now is because everything in the human perception system is about what was. It's about the past. Then we have a vestibular system, and that's what keeps us balanced. Have three canals in the ear. Some people get dizzy. I get vertigo. Sometimes optical illusions will distort your perception and confuse your brain because your brain is looking for past information that makes sense. When it gets information that doesn't make sense, the brain goes into confusion and further distorts your sense of reality. I wanted to uh, go to a lecture in London 
about how to build a roller coaster. And I met this wonderful gentleman, except it wasn't about how to build a roller coaster. It was about how to maximize the thrill experience of when you're on a roller coaster or Tower of Terror, one of the thrill rides. And it's called priming. When you know that your roller coaster is gonna start going down, or you're gonna drop in an elevator, or one of the parachute rides, your body, your brain goes, oh shit, this is not gonna go well. But what is happening is you're now being primed because with that anticipation, the experience is multiplied between two and 20 times just by priming the brain with anticipation of fear. And we have the mathematics for it. We understand the math behind this. It is the same math, roughly, that's in analog network security that goes through trust and levels of how much of this is going to be useful, how much can I believe, and it's called degradating curves and a lot of good math behind the whole thing. Then we have our sense of touch. Have any of you ever stubbed your toe and you feel it and your brain goes, oh shit, this is gonna really hurt. The reason you're doing that is that the pain nerve is, there's two systems. One is the slow one and one is the fast one. The fast one says, I just touched something. The really slow one is where it really hurts. Again, it's anticipation, the brain getting the body ready to prepare itself for pain. Because the only purpose of our brain, the only reason it exists, is for us to survive. There is no other biological need for the brain whatsoever. So we have all of these body sensors around us, pressure, hot, cold, and that tells us how we position ourselves with respect to the world around us. Then we have smell and taste. Smell when we're walking down the street and we're hungry, and you smell the garlic from an Italian restaurant. You already got a smile on your face with that one because you, you can almost smell it and almost taste it and you're, some of you are starting to get that little feeling of, oh, boy, that'd be really good. And all I've done is prime your brain by talk about Italian restaurant and garlic. These two senses do not go to the center of the brain. They go back to the animal brain because those were the senses that kept us alive, that keep animals alive, keeps nature alive by being able to sense things that are from a distance. Hearing is the biggest way that humans and animals stay alive. You've seen deers with their ears. They're, that's how they stay alive. So we have these five fundamental senses plus the vestibular balance sense, which has some fancy, fancy words, but it basically says, how does our body fit into the world around us? How do I walk here without looking at my feet? Why? Because the brain is predicting what it expects to happen. I don't know it, it's unconscious. This is all code programmed through experience that comes back out from memory and combines with my senses to create a sense of reality. There's lots of cool tech being developed. Uh, the one on the right is a suffocation machine. And it takes away all of your air while you're gaming or whatever fun you're having. Digital waterboarding. You don't think the U.S. government's got that somewhere where they can simulate drowning in an alternate reality? Of course they do. Now, the other piece of all of this, when we're going into the metaverse, in order to make 
reality better. I need a feedback mechanism. I need to know, as the person who is orchestrating and building this reality, I need to know how you're reacting to it. I can do eye tracking, I can do muscle tracking, I can do temperature sensing, I can do blood pressure sensing, and I can feed all of that back, all of that information back that tells the programmer how I am reacting to any given situation. The numbers are there, the amount of data that comes off just from an AR helmet alone. Look at the specifications on the Vision Pro from Apple. Some amazing technology that they put in there, and it's about feedback from the human body reacting to an event and telling the orchestrator what I did and how I felt. Biosensors, we got them all. They all exist, none of this is new at all. Personal area, personal area networks, they're getting better and better and better. Uh, some of you have maybe seen Len No or some of the transhumanists who have computers now built into their bodies. This is where all the technology is going. It's not there yet, but some of it is, and that becomes very, very scary. So when I look at the senses, when I look at the human experience, I look at it through time. It's like there is no now. 300 milliseconds to see something and react to it. 150 to hear something and react to it. They all are time-based, every single one of them. And when we start examining the metaverse through time, different answers start appearing than we would ever thought. Network security, network attack, this is the new attack surface in the metaverse. It's your brain. It is your senses. It is your sense and perception of reality. And that is where the meta-warriors are going to be going. It's called meta-content orchestration. When somebody writes music for an orchestra, they write out all of the pieces, all of the notes, and do the, it's orchestration. When Michael Jackson does a dance, it's orchestrating a dance. In the metaverse, whatever evolution piece of it we are in now and will be in the future, are going to be orchestrating content aimed at our senses very specifically in order to convince us that there is a different reality and that something that is not going on is or something that is going on isn't. And in many ways you can consider that what Penn and Teller and magicians do. They take advantage of the frailties, of the weaknesses of the human mind and work in and around them. And this is what we are building and we will have the tools not too long from now where anybody can do this. Anybody can affect what you're thinking and ultimately what you believe. And the numbers, this is all hardcore science. There is nothing magical. The only magic here is I've glued together a lot of different pieces trying to understand how this is all going to occur and what's going to happen. So when we have the full loop, we have the human being in the middle, and on the input to the human, audio, video, all of that that touches our sensors, and the haptics are interfacing with the actual technology itself. And all of these are in the domain of time. The output of the body is done through tracking mechanisms, through sensing what the muscles are doing, biosensors. So we have a whole set of inputs and a whole set of outputs. And somebody's going to be controlling all of this. 
So we look at it as an OODA loop. It's a continuous process because our brain, our perception, works at roughly 77 frames per second, which means that we create a new perception of reality every 13 milliseconds. Time. How can I mess with this time? OODA loops, they make things stronger. OODA loops, they make aerial combat. He whose loop is the fastest, he gets inside the time of the other guy. He who's fastest will win. And again, this is hardcore mathematics that has been proven since 1984 with OODA loops. So now we've got inputs, we've got outputs, we have us, and it's going along 77 frames per second. That's an OODA loop that we are living that we need to know how to mess with. So generation one is external sensing only. We're not going to dig holes in your body yet. We'll get there. But right now, it's external sensing, and that's all. But that is enough to create a new reality. The other thing that's going to be put in in the next 24 months will be what you think. We are now getting really, really good at being able to create pictures of what you are thinking. We can create typewritten words and sentences and write paragraphs of what you are thinking. Technology exists. This is one, this is the capability as of six months ago. There is a ton of research going on in this right now. And the reason is they want to give it to people who cannot communicate, have maybe they are locked in to their brain, but they can think. This would offer an incredible means for communication, but it can also mean a total, complete loss of human privacy at the same time. And I take this and I put it into my content into my metaverse experience, and now your mind thinks it's running the show, thinks it's controlling things, but really I am in still in control as the programmer, the orchestrator, and I know more about you than you know about yourself. So how are we gonna build all this stuff? Well, the first thing, a lot of this is not gonna happen tomorrow because we don't have the technology. In order for the full, full snow crash kind of metaverse, we need 10 gigabits of wireless up and down. There are all the specifications up there. I'm not going to go through them all. But we know what they are. There is research been going on on this for 40 years. Neuroscience has been driving it. The key mechanism here is that we talk about availability, DOS, DDoS, in security. Availability in the metaverse becomes latency. Latency means if it takes too long to process, I'm going to notice it. And what a meta content orchestrator wants to do is create a seamless experience for you so you don't see the glitch in the matrix, that it completely works all the time. Latency is going to be absolutely critical. We're going to need between 1 and 10 milliseconds of latency to the next edge. We're going to have new architectures that are required. And all of that tracking data, the sensing data, the content data is going to have to be orchestrated across multiple servers, multiple layers, and various clouds in order to make the experience as good as possible. The other thing that can happen is all of that sensing data is your private reactions. It's you. It's who you are. It's not your pr pr 
private information. It's how you think. And right now, has anybody read the Oculus 2 EULA? It says Facebook will try to protect your privacy. But we are going to share all of this information with our partners, and we have no control over what they're going to do with the information. That is the state of it today. And now we're going to be adding more and more sensing data and technology that's going to reflect who we are. And ultimately, this is kind of what it looks like. I've got my orchestrator there on the right. What is the purpose? What am I trying to do? Am I doing gaming? Am I doing education and training? OK. So there's the orchestrator, the programmer, sitting there and doing all this. All right. That concerns me a great deal. But this concerns me much more. Let's replace the human in the feedback loop with AI, where the AI makes the decisions as to what your content you receive, and the AI looks and studies how you react and how you behave. This scares the living hell out of me, because again, we're removing humans from the entire equation there. When it comes to OODA loops, I was mentioning when you do the math on it all, we can predict very accurately who is going to win. That's why when we talk about traditional network security, the attackers always have the advantage. Always have the advantage. Zero days. They have a huge time advantage. And when you analyze the math, and I'm not going to make you do it, but it's pretty simple, we can predict very, very accurately who is going to win in any particular kind of conflict. What we're doing, ultimately, is taking two OODA loops, taking the human system OODA loop, taking the orchestrator or the AI system OODA loop, and connecting them. But now look at the bottom there. Look at the amount of time each process takes. These are hard science numbers. I'm not making them up. Who's going to win if we allow this to happen? And what is more valuable than PII? Your social security, your health card. What is more valuable? What's more valuable is me knowing exactly what you will do, how you will react to any given situation. And when the AI in that feedback mechanism is making those decisions, it then is deciding how human beings should behave. Is that what we want? Now, one of the things that can be done, and I'm only going to give one example because I don't have a lot of time, wouldn't it be wonderful if your network clients turned off all security for 70 minutes every day and tell the adversaries exactly when they're turn you're turning it off. Who's that good for? That's good for the adversaries. 70 minutes a day. That is the human blind spot from our conscious to our unconscious. And the example here, I'm just going to use this one, a blink of our eye takes between 250 and 300 milliseconds. You see nothing during that time period, not consciously. But if I delay a little bit of time before I give an image while you are blinking, and I make it with sound, and I do all of the sensory inputs it's going straight to the brain down here. It is not going to your conscious decision making. The other portion of our blindness is called saccadic movement. Our eyes, if you've ever seen eye tracking charts, our eyes are all over the place. If I can predict 
when you're going to blink, if I can predict when these saccadic movements are going to be occurring, I now have a time-based entry into your brain that you will not be able to even know is going on. We've got three classes of all of this. We've got the personal one, which uh, is supposed to be for good, supposed to be doing nice things for people medically, for training, for school. There are some incredible applications. But meta-surveillance, capitalism, you guys are much more sensitive to it than we are in the U.S. Surveillance capitalism, understanding exactly how you will react means that Amazon or any retailer will be able to know exactly how to prime you when you're walking down the sh store and it's priming and it knows who and it moves you because it knows you better than you know it's yourself. And class three, this technology, as it matures, is ideal for converting faith, for programming people, for indoctrination, radicalization, extremism, and also for deprogramming. There is no difference between programming a human being and deprogramming a human being, except deprogramming is a lot harder to do. And I don't have time to go all the neuroscience on that, but the greater the level of immersion and belief of the environment, the more powerful the effect. No magic there at all. And disinformation, when disinformation is provided constantly to you, we've seen the damage already just using one sense, sense of reading. We've seen the damage that can do. When I put in disinformation into a believable world, what if you had the ability to go have a conversation with Jesus or Muhammad or ISIS? What are you going to believe? You know it's not real, but your brain is doing something else. You know, because that's that nine bits of information per second. But there's 400 billion more going on behind you that you don't know about, and that is what creates belief system. The Russians have been practicing this since the 1890s. I've had some strong interactions with the Russians in the 1990s on information warfare, and for them, Cyber war was not about technology. It's about messing with your brain, psychological operations, social engineering, whatever term we are going to use, the idea is the same. How do I distort your beliefs to do what I want you to do? And that's what we're building. That's what the metaverse is going to be doing. And like everything else, it's going to go downhill and always affect the individual, the individual person, the citizen of whatever country they may be. Those are the people who are going to be affected negatively by all of this technology. Do we trust Facebook? Do we trust Google to build this thing right with the correct safeguards, the correct privacy guidelines, and an off switch maybe? Do we believe that big tech is going to do any of this correctly. I am very suspicious because we do not know what neutrality is. We do not know what bias, how to zero it. We don't know, yet we're building systems that we say, and again, Facebook has openly said this, we know we make more money when disinformation is used, because people engage. We are not changing our algorithms. This is public information. They're already telling us they're going to screw with us even more. It's about storytelling, like I started this off with. 
every little piece of technology that's coming along. We have some today, some of it's brand new, some doesn't exist yet. But when you put them together, therein is the power. The power to change every single person on the planet with a new belief system that they never chose. Policies, we're engaging with the European Commission on this. Do we want this technology, AI and artificial dis reality distortion technologies, do we want them tied to each other with no controls, no policies at all? Do we want to let advertisers, on and on, have talked about, do we want this? Should there be reality distortion policies? How do you define the degree of reality distortion that's affected you? 1%, 50%, 100%? How do we measure this? We don't know this yet. And all of this technology is addictive. We know that today, 386 times a day, each of you on average is gonna check your phone. 386, that's pure addiction. These are digital drugs that release serotonin and the feel-good mechanisms, and they release more and more of it the more that you believe in your environment and your reality. We've got security and privacy concerns that are hours of discussion on their own of how we should, how we should, not that we will, how we should look at the future. Now, the technology behind it, how are we going to control it? Should we control it? Let big tech do it. Generation two, I'm not gonna get into it all, but that replaces our external sensory organs and talks directly to the nerves. Take out the eyeball. The eyeball feeds a data stream of 11 megabits a second to the brain. We are decoding that signal. Once we know how to replicate it, we don't need eyeballs anymore. We don't need ears anymore. We don't need any of it anymore. Once we know what those decoded patterns look like, and generation three, is where it's done directly to the brain. We have tech today that will allow them to put needles in your brain, for goodness, to help people with PTSD, with anxiety, with certain ailments, with some pain treatments. But they also bypass all conscious awareness. It's all done to our unconscious. And that goes back to the question, who is really in charge of who we think we are? Right now, there is one country in the world that's looking at this as a national security problem. That's Sweden. I've worked with the Swedes for 40 years, and they have stood up the first psychological defense agency to protect their citizens against the effects of some of the things I'm here talking about today. I'm trying to get the European Commission to discuss it because if you've read some of their papers, they do care about AI, they do care about the metaverse, they do care about privacy. But this is a whole new area that's combining biological networks, carbon networks, with silicon artificial ones. It's all new ground that we're going for. If you're interested in following up on the theories, analog network security is the one that goes through an awful lot of the math on how to make it work. And sometime uh, in September, there will be a new book out going through all of this in a lot of technical detail and a lot of policy uh, discussions as well. And it's called MetaWar. Thank you very much. I hope I have disturbed your day a little bit. I made it with a minute and 11 seconds. Uh, what do I do, is that a gentleman, is this a Q&A time or what's happening? Yeah. 
Yes, okay. <laughs> si vous avez des questions, uh, vous levez et uh, vous. Uh, des gens qui vont prendre, euh, qui vont vous entendre un micro. Nobody? They're gobsmacked. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be here through tomorrow if anybody wants to uh, yell at me or talk to me. I have a question for you. What are you um, doing here today? Um, you weren't I'm, supposed to be here until tomorrow, therefore I, I choose to ignore you because you were distorting the time <laughs> the line right now. Yeah, well, hacked. Um, you talk about the alignment of AI in this and how that's going to affect the activities, that you're, the, 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 the signal processing that's going to make this work is going to be affected by the alignment of the AI. Can you talk about how that policy that's being generated now might affect the meta war policies or behavioral psychology policies? Well, I know this British mathematician who uh, is going to be helping me with that exact question. I just finished those bits actually recently. Um, I, I have the general understanding right now of the time of each of the individual loops. Now, when you take each section of those loops and look at how each one of the components of them interact with the other, I don't know that yet. That's what you're gonna be doing, Dr. Carney. So thank you for that question. I do not know the answer, and you knew damn well I did not know the answer to that question. Any other questions? I will be here for two days if anybody wants to yell at me at all, I'm... I'm... Test? Yes, <laughs> thank you. Um, first of all, I would like to thank you for your presentation. Um, I'm one of those guys who don't know anything about the metaverse. And um, now that I saw what you have to tell, it's very interesting to see everything under, this, um, under the idea of how they will understand uh, how our brain works and everything. Mm -hmm. But um, I would like to have your opinion about uh, how this will affect the, the soft power of the of country like the United States, who have used, for example, Hollywood to diffuse uh, capitalism idea and all of those sort of things. So, okay, there is Facebook, Google, and all these evil bastards, but what what this will be in the future when country will not just be uh, creating movie, but also uh, have to learn how our brains work and diffuse right. those ideas. I've got okay. to answer this. Thank you. I've got to answer this quickly because it's a long answer. Uh, number one, 80% um, of Americans believe that the fictional movie JFK is history. So we begin there. We, uh, Hollywood's job is to distort your reality, to make you believe. And unfortunately, too many Americans are ridiculously gullible. But to answer the part two of that about governments, uh, currently in China, millions of school children are wearing headbands that are sensing their brain activity. All of this sensing goes to a console with the teacher. So they can go, Bob, you're not paying attention. They know what the kids are doing mentally. When you add that to some businesses in China doing weekly mental profiling of how your brain works under certain conditions, that's whether you get a promotion, whether you get yelled at, they're using this right now as part of their social contract in China to, for their scoring system. It has already begun, not to this depth yet, but they've already shown that they are very comfortable with different kinds of mind control and influence. So I just don't want my government getting it. God, no. All right, I think we're out of time, right? We're out, or we... Oh, sorry, one more. I'm sorry, I got that shot. Turn it off, turn it on again, you're good. I was just wondering about countermeasures. How can we 
You mean how to fix this? There's a lot of unknown. The, the research on this, I've, I really have only been doing it maybe three years. Uh, getting all of the hard science and the numbers was number one goal. So I had something to work with before I give it to Dr. Carney to figure out. How are all these pieces going to do this? We don't know that yet. How do we defend against this? There is an awful lot of talk um, in certain of the neuroscience uh, communities that are talking about training entire populations to recognize disinformation, to recognize reality distortion consciously so that we turn it off or can say no. That is very new research. I don't think that there's going to be an answer by September, but it is one of the paths. How do we train an entire population that they have been believing things that are just not true? How do you do that? And finally, in the last five years, some of the neuroscience community is actually working on techniques for deprogramming. It's like when somebody gets involved with a religious cult and they believe, 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 and then they have to be deprogrammed. They're starting now to actually examine how that might work here. I don't know the answer. I don't think we will for many, many years with a lot of science and a lot of studies and experimentation. We don't have it today. Okay. All right. Well, again, thank you all very much. I'll see you for the next couple of days. Appreciate it. Thank you.